Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship, where we have deep, real conversations to build empathy for one another and to take action to be more inclusive and to lead the change in our workplaces and communities. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst and author of How to Be an Ally. I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion speaker, advocate, and advisor. You can learn more about my work and sign up to join us for a live recording at ally.cc. All right, let's dive in. So welcome, everyone to Leading with Empathy and Allyship and our Change Catalyst live event series. This is a safe space to learn how to lead the change, build empathy for each other, and and understand those tangible actions we can all take to build a better world for our colleagues, friends, neighbors, and ourselves as well. A special thank you today to First Tech Federal Credit Union for sponsoring this episode. And today we'll be talking with three incredible guests about addressing burnout in the workplace. We'll talk about what causes burnout, um, how to prevent it, and how to support each other through it, and then also what managers and leaders can do to address burnout in the organization. Here to discuss the subject with me are Irena, founder and HABC head anti-burnout champion at Hucky Wellness, Al Dia, founder of Better Work Labs, and my friend, Anthony Ware, principal at Aware Catalysts. Welcome, you three. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. On screen, you'll see our ASL interpreters today, Jennifer and Norma. Um, Thank you to Interpreter Now for our ongoing partnership. We really appreciate you. All right. So... Um, let's take a moment to just first share our names and describe ourselves, describe ourselves for anybody who's blind and low vision. So I'll, I'll start. I'm Melinda Brianna Epler, and I am a white woman with long red hair. I'm wearing a dark blue and white striped long sleeve shirt. And in the background is a white room with some plants and uh, my book in the background and uh, a black couch with a couple of pillows on it. Hi, I'll go. I'm Irena Sargent. I am a black woman uh, with short blue hair today. I uh, just put in the wax and changed the color for the day just for this audience. Um, I am in my office with a bright teal wall behind me, plants. Um, one of my first uh, paintings that I purchased of a woman with a coconut that she is drinking out of to always set the vibe. So excited to be here. Oh, and I have a black sweatshirt that says anti burnout behavior. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Al D. Uh, I'm the founder of Better Work Labs. I am a Asian male uh, with black hair, uh, glasses, and a Navy shirt. Uh, When I am in my uh, office with a bookcase in the background and at my laptop. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Anthony Ware, and I'm a black man with uh, a black. polo shirt, um, wearing glasses, or me, I'm wearing glasses, not the polo shirt, um, and a creamish, <laughs> uh, white colored, uh, background. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. And Al, apologies. I, I think I mispronounced your last name. No worries. That. It's all good. Um, so would you all just take a few moments to, to say a little bit about, what you do and why addressing burnout is important to you. And Al, since we just talked, why don't you go ahead? Sure, I'm happy to. So I am the founder of Better Work Labs, which is an organization that works with companies who want to create better workplaces uh, for their people, uh, where they can thrive and reach their human potential. Um, Prior to founding Better Work Labs, I have worked in Uh, large corporations pretty much for my entire career, uh, both first as a management consultant, as well as working in a enterprise software company um, for the last few years. Um, I've seen firsthand um, the challenges as well as the implications of burnout, particularly on on people and particularly for people who are in um, high performing or fast moving um, environments. Um, I've seen this both in terms of being a people manager and leader, um, as well as experiencing it myself. Um, And I'm certainly happy to talk about that a little bit later, but part of why 
um, selfishly, I care so deeply about this is just through my own personal experience uh, for myself um, in trying to navigate um, burnout, um, as well as for others around me, both in terms of people I manage or coach, um, as well as uh, friends and colleagues. I'm, I'm really fortunate that I have a good network of, of people, um, both past colleagues and, and professional friends and things like that, and witnessing some of the challenges that, that they've faced, um, certainly over the past 18 to 20 months. Uh, but even before that, uh, particularly in, in environments that do really demand high performance, um, I have uh, a real big mission to figure out how I can play a role in helping create better workplaces where people can thrive, but to do so in a healthy way. Uh, and so that's, that's why I'm, I'm really committed to, to trying to do my best to, to help solve these, these challenges. I'll jump in. Um, I'm Irena Sargent. I'm the founder and CEO, and I always say, also say the head anti-burnout champion at Hooky Wellness. Yes, that is like play hooky, which is exactly the vibe that I'm looking to impart. So I'm extremely passionate about doing something about burnout because in layman's terms, it's trash. Um, and it is extremely common uh, before the pandemic, it was affecting over 77% of the professional workforce. Uh, it just took for us to go through a pandemic to start talking about it, um, to stop pointing mm -hmm. fingers and to stop acting as though it would go away on its own. Uh, I similar uh, similar to Al, I built my career in high performance environments. I've worked in industries including workspace design and office furniture. Uh, after getting my MBA at Indiana University, I moved into consumer goods and worked at Nestle, building some of the world's biggest most favorite brands. Um, and then I also spent some time in tech working at Intuit on the QuickBooks business. So throughout that journey, uh, about four years ago, I experienced my biggest uh, battle with burnout. Um, and that opened my eyes to how rampant it was, yet how far from alone I was. Um, so within that experience, I recognized how challenging it was to get the support you needed when you needed it most. Some of that being on the external side of the, the friction field support systems and some of that being on the internal. Uh, so that caused me, drove me really to pivot and to do something about it. Uh, so I am building in the process of building Hookie completely focused on burnout relief, providing comprehensive and practical support uh, for those high performers that to empower them to be a catalyst for an anti-burnout workplace. Um, we need all the support that we, we can have. Uh, so I'm excited to be on this panel and to be with other advocates in this space because the more conversations, the more advocates, the more hands-on in this space, the greater the change we can make because uh, it won't go away on its own. Going back to the office won't do it. Sorry to tell you, but excited <laughs> to have the combo, excited to get your questions um, and to share a little bit about what uh, we've been building, learning in this space over the past three years. Awesome. I love that playing hooky. Um, so for me, my uh, so Anthony Ware, uh, principal and founder of Aware Catalysts and uh, lead researcher, publisher uh, for Founder Mental Wealth. Um, and I, I wanted to think back of it when I really thought about this question. For me, actually, um, it gets personal down to when I was a teenager. Um, I was being raised by my or my dad raised myself, my two younger brothers. And one day I come home from junior high, I think it was, and uh, my dad's friend is waiting there saying, your dad's in the hospital. Um, and it was because of uh, exhaustion. So he was working working his job and then working his side hustle and not getting any sleep and rest. And so it was literally exhaustion, burnout um, that put him in the hospital, um, which then meant myself uh, and my two older brothers had to go do his side hustle. It was a janitorial business. Um, so when I really think about this, that's really the seed of, of why I work around burnout. And, and actually, with, for me, I focus on the whole concept of mental wealth um, and specific, specifically for underestimated uh, initially entrepreneurs. But the uh, range was expanded thanks to the pandemic um, to help um, ERGs in, in mid to, to large size companies um, with the concept of mental wealth, um, we can dig into it, but it's uh, help using that to help address uh, the challenges around burnout. Mm, yeah. Well, um, thank you for sharing that, that experience um, too. I think uh, each of you have had a uh, catalyzing experience with, with burnout um, in one way or another. Can you talk a little bit about 
what that experience of burnout is and maybe just take um, just like uh, three key signs or, or, you know, what is, what is, uh, I think a lot of us have a sense of what it is, but um, so if you could kind of distill it to three or so points, that would be awesome. Sure, I'll jump in there. Um, so technically burnout is the result of untreated chronic stress. Um, so it is not a fluke. It is not something that happens overnight, but it is a progression of things that are untreated and unmanaged. Um, my personal experience of burnout, I, I had many, I would say, because uh, this is not necessarily a one and done. So um, I've experienced all of the stages, but depending upon which research you read, uh, they can break it down in different ways. I like to use uh, three key stages. So the first one is exhaustion. That's the earliest warning sign um, that is a key indicator that something is off. This is more than being tired. This is a matter of chronic exhaustion where no matter what amount of sleep or additional naps you're adding in, you're still feeling depleted and lacking energy to do not just your basic task, but those tasks that typically would bring you joy. So exhaustion is a very, is a very common early warning flag that something is awry. The next stage that I always like to talk about is the stage where it's space of talking about withdrawal. So it's a matter of pulling away from those things, pulling away from those people uh, that could be very fulfilling in past, but needing to go inside. Um, so in this space, you often hear people also replacing positive coping mechanisms or methodologies of managing stress with false cures is what they're called. So doubling down on alcohol, cannabis, those things that can be used recreationally, but you notice it becomes more of a crutch and you often even recognize that it's an unhealthy usage of it. Um, so those are some of, those are just two of the example, but there are of course more. And then the third stage um, is where it really turns into a slippery slope. Um, so this is where it's defined really as a detachment. So you start to feel empty inside is what people can describe. Things are all for naught. Cynicism in a, is in an all-time high, um, all-time high. Everybody's stupid and no one can do their job around you is very common. Um, but this is where it can quickly turn into official mental health challenges and issues. So depression, anxiety, and other things are quickly at your door, um, as well as PTSD-like symptoms can start to arise. And I, I had some of those where my outlook would trigger a visceral, physical <laughs> internal reaction to it. Um, and there's many, many other symptoms and signs, but those are some of the top ones, very common. Um, so just those three stages. And then last but not least, stress and burnout are not the same thing. So being very, very aware that, um, that they are very different. Burnout is what happens when you do not treat stress and even stress has multiple stages. So it, I, I'd like to call it out because it's, it's, we're getting into the space of greenwashing burnout where all of a sudden everybody's dealing with burnout and we don't want to discount this very deep internal feeling that can happen, especially in the third stage, which is around detachment. Al or Anthony, you want to add? Yes. Um, for me, I think, I think burnout was, um, I know I talked about my, my father previously, but I've had, um, uh, you know, similar, like, phases throughout my, especially when I looked at the last three decades of going from corporate, working in a corporate environment, um, high, high pressure um, uh, in, in commercial real estate. And then over the last decade, running four or five different companies, um, running, starting, failing. Um, and and I think the, 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 the thing to realize is that um, unless something gets really bad or, or really off, oftentimes you don't realize you're in the burnout. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's just it, it, until something. And for me, the thing that like, now I can look back, the thing that clicked is, is the detach, like starting to detach from, from people. And I'm social, like that is just me by nature. And, and uh, actually, fortunately enough, I had people, good people around me uh, to point out like, Hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Like, not like, hey, we we want to go hang out, but just we haven't seen you, um, and 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 so I think when it comes to burnout, I love 
you know, how the foundation of this conversation has gone is that like, for me, it just was realizing that that was that I had that issue or I had that challenge. Um, and during the pandemic, it's been much of the same. Yeah, I would just, I, I loved what both of them already said, but I would also add, I think for me, the, the one that really stuck out um, was just this general feeling of not being myself. And so as an example to what Anthony had said, I am also a pretty outgoing and social person in general, generally speaking, I enjoy being around other people. And I also am someone who tends to be pretty positive. And I think the big kind of aha moments for me was when I stopped being both of those things. Uh, I started not being the positive person. I started being a little bit of the cynic. Um, I started not being upbeat about the work I was doing. I mean, certainly I've always, you know, uh, every now and then you always kind of complain about work. That was a little bit to expect it, I think for me, but it was to the point where it was just, it seemed so out of character. And I think to maybe what Anthony said at first, I, I didn't really understand it. It really took other people around me to shine a light back, to be able to say, Hey, not only are you not being yourself, but there might be some reasons for why this is. And that was kind of the aha moment where I was like, oh, okay, there's this clinical thing called burnout. And that was what really honestly led me to kind of explore more about it. And once I learned more about it, and once I um, started talking to more um, professionals, you know, licensed professionals, health professionals about it, I started to realize, okay, uh, now I could potentially understand why I'm not being the person that I normally am. Mm. Mm. Um, so, what, so what is the cause? What is the cause of it? Um, how, how do we start to recognize that? I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, mm. So I can, I can maybe start, you know, with this. And I think that for me, at least, one of the things I started thinking a lot about was just the general work environment that I was in. Um, you know, one of the things as someone who has been, or I'd like to think I've been a high performer for all of my career is that typically when something has gone wrong or something maybe didn't work out the way that I wanted it to, I always kind of thought, okay, what could I have done better? What could I learn from this? What could I do differently? Right. And I think at first, that was kind of the mindset that I took when I was experiencing um, potential symptoms of, of what could be considered burnout. Eventually, because of, again, of the coaching that I got and the, the advice that I got, I started to realize that in a lot of cases, like burnout isn't so much about you or what you did or what you didn't do, but it has a lot to do with the environmental factors that exist. Um, in this case, within the workplace, but certainly it could also be depending on who you are or what you're experiencing, you know, other aspects, you know, of your, of your life. Um, and so once I started looking more at kind of those environmental factors of the works, the space that I was in, that's when I started realizing, okay, um, this isn't just about me. Um, this is something that's, you know, bigger than me. And so, you know, for me, that was kind of the first kind of step I took towards understanding more deeply um, what potentially was was causing this for me? And I, if I can point to one thing, I'll give one tactical example, and then I'll I'll let uh, my other fellow panelists maybe chime in as well. Um, so I, during um, uh, over the past you know year and a half or so, uh, in the group that I was in, we went through constant change. Um, there were just a lot of just moving pieces to our business. Certainly, COVID did not help. And I think at one point in time, I counted we we went through maybe six or seven um, organizational changes, either with a team getting moved in or a new leader coming in or someone going mm -hmm. away. And I think as I reflect back on it and try to think about how that might've impacted me, I can definitely see the detachment coming into play because after maybe about the third or fourth change, I think in my head, I started to wonder, well, why am I even doing this? If I, you know, if someone else is just going to come in and throw my work out the window and make me work on something new. And so that was like one example where I could see maybe the environment, some of the environmental factors I'm um, really playing into some of the burnout that I was experiencing. Irina or Anthony, go ahead. 
I, I, I want to like actually build off of what Irena was saying, you know, the difference between stress and, and burnout. There, there is a difference between stress and burnout. Um, and I think fundamentally, when you look at burnout, it's, it's been because of the culture. Like if you look at like the last hundred years of in the States and then in Europe and other places, like this whole concept of work, be the best, whatever that means, um, you know, our unhealthy, not unhealthy, but the relationship of stress, like there's a book called The Upside of Stress, um, which I love because, you know, reframing what stress is, like all, all stress isn't bad stress. It just depends. Like there's stress to have a baby. There's stress for an airplane to take off. Um, um, but like this whole concept of the culture that we built into this workplace, uh, the workplace, um, and culture in its broadest sense. And so like getting plugged into that from childhood into birth, and now we have the pandemic and are, are coming out of it and people are, are, are trying to go back to normal. Well, normal got us to this point where we have to have this panel. Like there is a pot, there is a, a universe where the normal, this panel doesn't need to exist, but I think fundamentally mm -hmm. Um, I think the cause of burnout is that we, we've been programmed um, into the things that make this happen. So whether it's, you know, performance reviews or not, not making mental health as fundamental as, as, you know, physical health and those kind of things. Um, so I, that's like the broader, I think on a broader level. I'll add a couple of notes onto that. Um, completely agree with everything that has been shared. Um, I'm very much, a and ba type a so i think in things and frameworks um so uh there's a couple things that have been known uh, as i was talking about the workplace the workplace is a very common driver of burnout but it is not the only driver um but when you think about it there are six known and proven dimensions of what happens in the workplace that can lead to burnout um so that's things that we all know workload key um there's a matter of fairness there's a matter of reward. There's a matter of values, community, perceived control. So those are like data backed, known as the drivers in the workplace. And you can imagine how the changes over the past two years don't quite line up to favorable conditions in many of those buckets, especially perception of control. Um, and so that's workplace. But when you think about burnout, it's bigger than work. Even for those of us who work is a very big part of our identity. Um, for me, life lifing was a big part of why my burnout happened because I didn't have the bandwidth to handle the things that normally I was able to ha handle. So for me, my version of life lifing was a dual income household moving across the country multiple times within a year, dealing with starting new jobs and career, an aging, ailing parent that had cancer and figuring out just life and internal changes of, I don't like this anymore. This is no longer the path for me. But when you think about life, we don't talk about those transition points um, like they are normal, but they are normal. We are not especially when you look at millennials, we're not in the mindset of staying in one career path for 60 years. It's just not what we do. Um, so what about those shifts? And so when you think about life, growth and changes, changes in internal values, which is another big thing that has been going on over the past year with people as things are coming to light, those are all things that breed burnout conditions and can layer on top of everyday ongoing stress that just exists in life. Um, so what causes burnout? It is a myriad of things, which is why it is such a complex issue and that there is no silver bullet. If anyone ever tries to sell you a silver bullet, go the other way. There are things that can be done. There are things that can lessen the impact. There are things that can improve situations, but it is complex. It is personal. It is systematic collective and individual, but there are things that can be done at all levels. And once you start understanding the, the things that can cause it and breed the conditions, we can start making these much needed structural changes because hustle culture is not it. It was never great. There is no badge for burnout. So let's stop wearing it. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's take each of those um, um, starting with the individual, because so many of us, I think are experiencing this, that there are some things I think 
um, that each of us can do to um, to address it in ourselves. So let's 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 start with solutions at the individual level. Irena, do you want to since you're just there? Yeah. Um, so there are three things that I like to say, um, and I like to use very marketing language or metaphors. Take your vitamins. Um, when we think about burnout, it is not a sickness. It's not like, oh, you have a cold, go take this. It is a matter of what can you do to prevent prevent and get ahead of it. It's like, I have hip issues. If only I did the exercises my physical therapist gave me, then I could avoid the flare-ups. But, oh, surprise, here we go. I have to go back. Um, and it's the same type of thing with burnout. And I run into this with a lot of clients. Is they're like, I thought I changed this. And it's like, but were you doing the same behaviors ongoing? So taking your vitamins is a matter of practicing those mental wellness tools and behaviors that we know help. It is proven. Um, we know that meditation helps with managing symptoms of anxiety and stress. We know that doing some type of physical activity helps. We know that doing some type of communal and community activities help. All of those things really matter. It does not have to be the way in which everyone else does it. So finding your lane and your way into wellness is huge. And think of that as your vitamins. I call them cheat codes, um, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, Another one is recognizing when life is lifing for you. So if your bandwidth is not what it normally is, you have to adjust. There's no badge in being a superhero anymore. Like, especially for those of us of color, like, and especially for black women, we are, are known to do it all. That was never sustainable. And it's really not now. So no, there's no surprise that people of color have higher levels of, of burnout. There's no surprise that women have higher levels of burnout. It's because they're already juggling a lot. And so especially recognizing when things are not normal and your bandwidth has changed and you need to change those behaviors accordingly, that's another big thing. Um, and then giving yourself, I always say space and grace. All these are easier said than done. The hardest part is giving yourself permission to do things differently. So bringing a little rebel in your life, play hooky, hence the whole thing about playing hooky. Give yourself that space to do what you need. For me, it took for my therapist to literally put me on timeout um, in order for me to start doing that. That is why playing hooky is the way in. I was on leave and I was still working. And she, in week one, she was like, this is not what we're here for. Um, and so she put me on timeout where I could not work during certain periods of the day, even though it was on my business. And so in that I found the space to connect with others. I found the space to do those things that were on my list that I always said I was going to do. And those were exactly those things to refill the cup. So taking your vitamins before you need it in the world of mental wellness, recognizing your bandwidth and changing accordingly, and then giving yourself permission to do more of what you actually need. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, one of the things that's like helped me and then has also helped uh, uh, some, of, some of my clients, the ones that actually do it, um, to Irina's point. Um, it, it, Take your is, vitamins. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. is, is actually uh, looking at it um, on a bigger picture and then bringing it back down to your individual level. So on the bigger picture, I, I always talk about like living in we're living in three contexts or living through. So there's like pre-pandemic, the pandemic, and then post-pandemic. Um, unless you're over hundred years old, you don't know anything about living through a pandemic. Um, but when you look back to like the twenties, thinking in terms of there was a pandemic, there was the roaring twenties for a certain amount of people. And then there was the great depression. So the way I like to frame it is like now we're in the pandemic and the rest is kind of an unknown. So realizing like you're going to be in that unknown. So everything you do and, and your framework or being is based off of that. And then going back to like uh, looking like looking at the things that brought you joy in the past um, and seeing either if you can do them or do them in a different version of them. And for me, I look back um, when I look through some of my like back, back, back to my childhood, like I love drawing. So like picking up, Right now, a lot of these companies have like giving you like free months of whatever. So I picked up Skillshare so I can start learning how to draw. Um, I got back into running marathons, not to, not to like pound my chest or like post on social media because I enjoy them. And they're 
the safest way for me to see the majority of a city I'd ever want to see. Um, so like, for example, running in Miami, 26 miles, roads closed, I can see the city and it brings me joy. It, the training sucks, but it, all, <laughs> but it brings me joy. Um, and I think the, the, the third piece is, I think, uh, like nutrition. Uh, there's the studies out now around like, it really does matter what we put in our bodies. And I'm not saying like your, your weight or your, you know, anything like that, but like truly like what we eat, um, just as much as like what we consume, like from media, like totally infects us and affects us. Um, and, and, and so like, I think the last piece is just keeping it all simple, uh, to the point of like grace, like whatever you plan also plan for it all not happening. Are you waking up, not feeling like I didn't feel like going on a run this, this morning. I did it. It sucked. I had some, some good thoughts in the end. I feel really good again. Um, and I know that's like a mental wealth deposit, as I call it to like build up my bank because I know burnout's going to happen. Like I'm going to face it or, you know, in the coming years, because there's so many unknowns in my 46 years, there's been a lot of unknowns. So there's going to be more. The, the thing that I would, would add, you know, I think to um, what's already been said is that um, I, I really, I love what you said about giving yourself grace. And I think particularly coming from some place where I've always been very driven and have been in high performing environments, I've always looked that, better often than not is to get somewhere faster and quicker. And when I started, you know, experiencing burnout for, you know, this time around, I really had to force myself to, to be kind to myself and to give myself time um, to, to do what I needed to do to get back to being a better version of myself. Um, and I, I think that um, making this time around, making space for myself to just um, to, to, to be patient and to, to, to take my vitamins, but to, not necessarily put additional added pressure that uh, I need to get back by this date or I need to get back by that date. Um, because um, ultimately, you know, life's not a race. Um, and Anthony, to your point, like, even if you thought it was like, you don't have direct control over it at, at, at any given time, there's a lot of things that can never happen. And so I think as an individual, just being able to give yourself some grace uh, to do what you need to do, I think is really important. And then as an individual, another thing I would add is that, you know, if, if you're someone who um, either is around other people who are in environments like this, or if you're a manager or leader, um, even if you are okay, there's a decent likelihood that someone you know um, is potentially in a challenging spot. And so as an individual, I, I think um, you know one thing that you can do, and, and I remember um, Emily Nagasaki wrote about this in her book, but one of her lines was, um, the, the, the way to be burnout is to care more deeply. Um, we, we as individuals, um, I think, uh, and part of the reason why I think this is so important to me, one of the things we can do as ourselves, particularly those of us who are in positions of power, um, can be more thoughtful and be more um, mindful of, of, of what's going on with, with our people. Um, and uh, from tactically, just in terms of you know, making sure you're checking in um, and developing a sense of trust so that when you do ask your employees, how are you doing? Um, they they can feel honest and be honest with you and and open up if they are potentially struggling with something whatever that may be, uh, but certainly not limited to just the workplace. Also, your friends, your family members, and and things like that. So as an individual, it's it, even if you are you do feel like you're in a decent position. Just remember that there's probably someone you know close to you who might be experiencing this and and to check in on that. Yeah, yeah, and and you're anticipating kind of my where I want to go next with the, the conversation too. I just want to say one one thing here that I have um, found that might be helpful for somebody out there, which is that um, you really do have to find your own solutions, and um, and that it's important to listen to the experts and 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 really you know understand in general like what what um, what you can do and. Um, bring it back to your own life. Uh, I will say that I had um, about a month ago, I was really hard on myself because I was working hard and I was thinking I'm not supposed to be doing that because everybody says you're supposed to take time off. Everybody says you're supposed to take time off. But when you do that, you're actually creating more friction too in your life. And I found, well, 
okay, I, in this moment in time, I can't work less, but what can I do? How can I build in that resilience? What can I do? So I started meditating for five minutes in between meetings. I started doing walking meditations from my desk to the kitchen and back and, and just bringing in little moments of mindfulness that really fundamentally change um, my wellness. Um, and then also, you know, like Anthony said, really spending spending more time or not spending more time, but just um, thinking about what was going into my body so that I was not um, uh, uh, treating myself with junk food. I was treating myself with healthy food and making sure that my body felt good. And that exercise, again, like taking walks in between meetings or during meetings. So all of these things can make a big difference too. So I think it's also important is to find your own path of, res of resilience making and, um, and, and whatever that is uh, for you without rather than um, that potential friction of hearing what you're supposed to do and, um, and then getting hard on yourself for not doing it, which is contributing to the problem, not the solution. Um, so uh, let's talk about let's talk about solutions at the um, at the manager level and at the leadership level. What can what can people who are managing people do to to really um, notice when their team might be experiencing burnout? And also, um, I think working to do what you can so that they don't experience burnout. Yeah, I this, I, I I wanted to jump in here because. I read something this morning just blew my mind. So not blew my mind. It's not surprising. Um, it, there was a study in the UK and I got to read deeper into it, but it's like 43% of all sick days um, in this study were actually attributed to burnout for these individuals. Um, and again, I don't know the sample size yet, but it's, it's, that's, that's something that's frightening on, on a lot of levels. Um, unless there's going to be action around it. Um, and then in the U S you know, there's all these well-being programs, but uh, I think Harvard just did a report or a study on the Harvard business review um, that uh, they broke it out between mental well-being, physical, and I think financial. And I paid more attention to the mental because um, that's what I focus on. <laughs> but they, in, in the, in that study, they were saying like, 87% of the people said that there was a well-being program offered, but it was like 23% of the people were actually using it. And, and so when you think on an organizational level and for managers, um, yes, you, you know, try to think of things to prevent, but you're already spending money on things that can help your employees. Um, you're really good at understanding the gap between what your customers need and the solutions you want to provide, well, start to look inside and figure out what your employees need. And it's not going to be a blanket thing. It's like offering Calm app to everybody isn't the solution. It is, it is part of, I use it, I mean, but it's part of, and I think so as managers and leaders, um, you need to model what you want um, or, or gosh, not to sound corporate -y, do as you do as you say, so your employees can do as you do. Um, whether it's mental well-being or like pay time off, um, uh, I'm a fan of unlimited uh, PTO as long as leaders model it. Like, are you taking time off? Um, are you emailing somebody at ten in the morning when the everyone on the, the team knows that that person is out on vacation or out on a mental wealth day or out on, you know sick leave or something. Um, stop just talking about it and actually be about it. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's different from a corporate to a mid-sized company to a startup. I think as a startup, um, there's no reason you should have back-to-back -back meetings uh, or you can, don't complain about back-to-back -back meetings if you're a leader. If, you're, if it's your company, <laughs> you, can, you can make the adjustment. Um, and then you know, make the time, I think early on, especially startup founders, um, as you're building your team, um, build in the systems and processes and mechanisms, some formal and informal, um, to help you understand the needs of your, your team, um, whether it's a, a roster or a, a, a roster uh, kind of thing. It's like, hey, my favorite thing, food is this. My favorite place to visit is this. 
Here's how I like being communicated with. Here's um, those kind of things, I think, help you understand how to help the person. So then when you have these solutions that you want to provide, um, one, you're getting proper ROI for your investment. But two, your team, your team is getting the proper things they need um, to be able to uh, combat, prevent, um, live a better life of which being an employee is part of their life. Irena, yeah. Yeah, I'll add a couple of things um, to definitely echo everything Anthony was saying on that. Um, within the managers, some of the biggest things, uh, absolutely illustrating the behavior is huge. Um, it's actually one of the number one reasons that people don't use their benefits um, and they don't take their time is they don't see their leaders doing it. So they don't think there's actual support in the organization to do so. Um, and people are dealing with internal conflicts of looking like a slacker, even if they feel themselves wilting inside. Um, it's not that they don't want to perform. It's not that they aren't trying to work hard. Uh, if they are dealing with burnout, they literally have no energy to do it. And so if you can be the difference of your employees taking a day off before they need it, look at it in a good way. You get a day off too. Like you are taking the benefits. These are, this is part of your compensation package. Um, I harp on this all day. In 2018, there were 768 million unused vacation days in the U.S., that is ridiculous. Just point blank. It is just ridiculous. And it was about a third of those just got wiped away and weren't rolled over. So com individuals are literally giving money back to their companies and saying, you know what? Never mind. I don't need my full compensation pack. Um, we are no longer our parents' generation where it was a brag. I've had conversations with my father-in-law who talked about the years he went without taking vacation days. It's not a good look. That's not, once again, not, not brag value. So by you taking time, by you talking about taking time, not because you're traveling the world, but because you laid on your couch, uh, because you were exhausted. Those are the things that illustrate little small changes that can add up. Um, that was 768 million unused vacation days in 2018. Um, and even last year, we were sitting on a PTO bomb where organizations were scared because people weren't taking their time off despite the pandemic. So this isn't, this isn't a fluke. Um, another big one is clarification and community. So our community, communication. So being transparent, even as a leader, you don't have to know it all. Uh, and when you fake it, your employees know it. So when you're like, oh, we have all the answers, they know you're lying. So if you don't know, but you're working on it, communicate that. It's the lack of communication that causes churn, that creates the rumor mill, that creates unnecessary stress. We are not in a situation where we need stress added. So if you can just say, hey, we recognize this, we're working on it, we will communicate when we have an update. Those little things make a world of difference. Just think about how that would impact you in your lives. Um, being flexible. There's that wonderful debate about going back into the office. And as someone who works in office furniture and office space design, I'm a little bit conflicted. Uh, but we cannot expect people to just go back into the office like all is back to 2018. There's no new normal. So instead of worrying about how can we get back, how can we build towards the future in which people are starting to work? It's not a matter of future of work. It is what is work now. We are in the midst of building the future of work. So starting from a blank slate and just creating it from scratch and bringing in the buy-in of your employees in that build is huge, huge. Every organization is going to be different. So we just have to recognize, hey, we're starting over. What does that look like? Um, and then last but not least, getting very real. Stop rewarding bad managers. Let's just, let's just stop it. Point mm -hmm. blank period. Like mm -hmm. I, it is so frustrating to continually see bad leaders move up the ladder and organizations who are very knowledgeable about what is going on because some people actually have uh, the oomph to say it in their exit interviews. So you cannot act as though you don't know these people are adding on additional pressure. The toxicity is actually more costly to your organization than many other things. It is more costly than throwing away like un unnecessary training. The toxicity is rampant 
and it is doing you a disservice. So stop rewarding bad leaders and managers and stop rewarding your good people with more work. There is a limit to that. And people are calling your bluff and saying no. So finding the happy balance, it's, it is new. It is uncomfortable, but it will make a world of difference. And people talk about organizations that care about them. Word of mouth is your most powerful tool. So let's build towards that future of work that we are already in and stop trying to act like we can go back in time. So yeah, I had to drop that one in there because it's a point of frustration for me, as you can mm-hmm. probably feel. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, it makes a huge difference. And and I will say that what I'm hearing is very similar. To, you know, I work with management teams a lot on on helping them build more inclusive teams, and 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 it's very similar work that just you know leading with empathy and really really understanding um, what your team is uniquely going through and doing the work around that and. I love that. Um, I want to jump into a couple of questions. We have we have we have several actually. Um, uh, so um, let's take this one um, from Katie. Uh, I would love to hear more about burnout and detachment, particularly related to acquisitions. How to best handle that? So in in these big transition moments um, in teams, um, are there any tips and tricks on keeping people involved when they're happening? acquisitions in particular. Anybody have thoughts? Or just in general, kind of these bigger transition moments on teams? Um, I'll take that one. I'll, I'll, I'll share some thoughts. Once again, we all know, I think we've all agreed, there's no silver bullet to anything. Um, but an acquisition is very much like any major change in organization. That's same as a reorg, same, same as office closing. It is a major shift. Um, And one of the first things is to recognize it's a major shift. Um, And so speaking to it as though it is such, I'm recognizing that there will be some internal um, anxiety that comes with it is huge. So how can organizations help? Leaders talking about the impact to them and how they're managing it goes a long way. So it recognizes it and builds empathy at the highest levels. Um, So that's huge making sure employees understand the tools and resources that are available to them that can help them balance in their personal life. Uh, There is a huge lack of awareness of mental wellness tools and resources in orgs. That's why utilization continues to be extremely low. Um, There is also a lack of trust in said tools. So covering off on those gaps and just being upfront, speaking to the confidentiality of things that are managed by third parties, highlighting where these resources are and empowering your managers to actually enable their teams to use them, um, those will go a long way. Acquisitions are long, so uh, let's not act like it's all going to be gone away just by someone signing up for their six EAP program or six AP sessions. So what are you doing along the way? What kind of check-ins can be put in where the community can talk, where true concerns can be highlighted and addressed? Once again, it doesn't have to be a perfect answer. Your answer can say, we don't know yet. But just making sure that there is a way to get that feedback loop going so that people feel heard and that it is actually authentic um, and not just PR speak. Your employees know that, too. They can tell they're talking about it when you're not in the coffee room or on that Slack. So um, that is a major change. So recognizing it, communicating within it, creating community and support, and then recognizing some people are just not going to be okay with it and they're going to leave. And so by people are going to leave organizations point blank period. So don't make it a toxic experience that makes them talk badly. Once they leave, still support them. They're part of your community and part of your network and will continue to be a part even once their LinkedIn changes. So those are some, they're not as, uh, they're not extremely detailed, but hopefully super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing that stands out to me and then I'm going to, make the assumption that uh, if you're asking the question, you you care about your people and you want what's best for them. But assuming that's the case, um, anytime there's a big change like that, there are things that are going to be within your control. And then there are going to be things that are going to be out of your control uh, as an employee and as the manager. And I think the best thing that you can do um, is to help your employees understand, A, that concept, uh, but B, um, what help them kind of get context around what is it within their control? And then what is outside of their control? Um, I think the best thing in those situations is to help people feel empowered so that um, they can make the best decisions possible. 
um, you know, to your point, um, you know, you may not know exactly what's going to happen, right? These do things do take a lot of times. Um, anytime an acquisition is done, um, attrition is always baked into the, to the cost of the sale. And so the company knows that as well. Uh, but if you really care about your people and you want what's best for them, um, try to help them as best as you can understand the things that are within their control and the things that are outside of it. And, you know, to the point, um, you just made, like if, if, um, even if they do choose to leave the way that you help them leave, they'll remember that. And whether that's for karma or just for the chance to potentially work with them again, they will remember you for how you left. And that was the one thing I will say in my experience that I am incredibly grateful for is that I had a manager and a set of leaders who um, were very supportive uh, about and gave me whatever I needed to make sure I was okay. And I will always remember that and will be always be very, very grateful for that. Yeah. Um, I just want to add one thing on that. It could even be as much as communicating what like is important mm-hmm. to you and your leadership team in this uh, transition. So it could be your commitments to your employees. Like these are the things that we can commit to you, or these are the whys or the things that we want to make sure to keep top of mind. Like just even those things, it helps understand the why. Cause when people don't know why, and they just see stuff happening that creates angst and they fill in gaps. So think of it as a personal relationship and where would the things drive you mad um, and then fill in those gaps for your employees as best as you can. But good luck in that. That I think mm-hmm. is a great thing. So congratulations. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say one more thing is that communication is so important through, through acquisitions too. And, and, you know, going through the unknowns and the, the, the less unknowns there are, the, the better there too. Um, so uh, we're just about out of time. I, I do want to ask um, very quickly um, from each of you, if you could say just one quick thing about how you would have wanted an ally to show up for you when you were experiencing that burnout. Just one, one, one thing um, fairly quickly. I, I'd have to say, I, I would want an ally to... And, and, it, and it happened. So check on me. And when they checked on me, like check, you know, how were that communicate? Like, Hey, let's meet up for whatever. Um, they were present for me, not to, and present to hear me um, and listen to me. And if I asked for things um, for solutions or for help, um, then they chime up, but they wouldn't be there to fix me because I wasn't broken. Mm. Um, I think that, I think that's, I mean, it's the human thing. Like that's mm. how, I mean, take out all the, the PR, take out all the, the con- constraints, just as an ally, show up human to human. Um, mm. If you built that trust, mind you, you got to build that yeah. trust first. Otherwise I'm not going to talk to you. Awesome. Al, do you have something or. Okay. Yeah. I would just say, I would want them to ask, how are you? And, and, and truly mean it and truly want to listen. Awesome. Um, I would add, I was very lucky to have a good ally and one of my managers um, during my experience. And the best thing he did was uh, to have real conversations um, and reset mm-hmm. expectations. And even some of that was a matter of, hey, I thought I was going to be in this top box, but the way that life is going, this is what I'm aiming for. And then we reorganize responsibilities accordingly. So being very real about what needs to get done and how you get it done, because as a leader, you still have objectives, but you can still be human um, while managing a team. So recognizing it and then restructuring how work gets done so that the people who need to breathe can breathe. um, But you can also keep going in what you are honestly getting paid to do. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, all three of you, for this great discussion and sharing the wisdom um, that you have today. Really appreciate you. Um, and, and to our audience, as many of you know, I ask each time for you to commit to taking action because uh, it's important that we listen and we learn and we take action. Um, so my question to you is, is how will you support a colleague this week? Um, you know, will you check in with them? Um, we, we definitely heard that. Will you, will you work to create um, the, the structural changes that are needed? Will you, um, how will you um, support folks either who are experiencing burnout or um, making sure that they're not going to experience burnout? Um, 
So thank you all for, for listening, for your questions. Uh, our next live show is December 7th on redefining normal in the remote and hybrid workplace. Irena actually uh, hinted at that, that subject in, in this episode today. So it's, it's time to redefine normal, what that, what that looks like. So hope to see you all there. Thank you, everyone. And thank you again, Al, Anthony, and Irena. Really appreciate you. Thanks again to First Tech Federal Credit Union as well. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. To learn more about this episode's topic, visit ally.cc. Allyship is a journey. It's a journey of self-exploration, learning, unlearning, healing, and taking consistent action. And the more we take action, the more we grow as leaders and transform our communities. So what action will you take today? Please share your actions and learning with us by emailing podcast at changecatalyst.co or on social media, because we'd love to hear from you. And thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel and share this. Let's keep building allies around the world. Leading with Empathy and Allyship is an original show by Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. Appreciate you listening to our show and taking action as an ally. See you next week.